It's the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Raymond Sims Show on the on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. You can catch the streaming live at Spreaker.com under the Sims Coliseum profile, and you can catch this on demand both on Spreaker shortly after the completion of the episode and on the Coliseum Sports Network YouTube page at YouTube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sports Net. Today's episode is in media res, which is, uh, I forgot the exact term for what it means. It's Latin though. It means joining in the moment, usually used for stuff like plays or, or like screenplays and things like that. But I'm using it for a sports talk show, you know, make it a little more cultured. The ESPN college basketball tip off marathon. I don't know if that's even the official name. I probably could have saved some words there, but that's what I'm going to call it here. It's currently going on on the ESPN family of networks. You know, it's all over the place. Um, I have it on. I'm in Studio B today. Usually I'm in Studio A at the Coliseum headquarters in Chicago. I'm in Studio B today, the one with the television. So because I want to, you know, at least have an eye on what's going on with the basketball games but for instance the one that's on now which pits the uh, northern iowa panthers against the stephen f austin lumberjacks is on espn2 a lot of the games have been on espn2 so far in in this marathon but it's probably going to find itself switching around especially as we head into prime time and there'll be more games going on uh specifically tonight the big game are going to be the doubleheader in Indianapolis, the Champions Classic. The first game is between Michigan State and Duke, and that will be followed shortly after by Kansas and Kentucky. But that does not mean that there there wasn't already a share of great basketball that happened last night when this marathon officially kicked off at 6 o'clock Central Time. And the first game was... It was two different games happening in tandem. It was... Uh, well, it was the the men's game on ESPNU was Miami and Florida, but the women's game was Baylor and Kentucky. And the only reason I had paused there for a moment was because I wasn't sure if Baylor, Kentucky came first or if Stanford and UConn came first. But it was one or the other. It was a women's game on ESPN two, and then Miami against Florida on uh, ESPNU. So it's been pretty hectic to start off. I really do wonder just how many people are out there trying to watch the whole thing. I have tried to do that over the years. I think ever since they came up with the concept of having 24 hours of basketball, I've always challenged myself every year to try to watch as much of it as I could to try to watch all 24 hours, but I never would make it. In most cases, I would usually have class to go to or something like that, or I would just sleep like a normal human being this particular marathon i didn't but that was really because i was working on you know working on my projects that i've been dealing with uh pretty much from the from the jump you know doing more work on that so i had to sit out the the overnight games you know the 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 token hawaii home game which has to come on because nobody else in their right mind is going to be playing at four in the morning so Hawaii and High Point, that was the the obligatory Hawaii game. Uh, New Mexico State and St. Mary's, I I just that that did not draw me at all. That name, I know. Yesterday, I was hoping that St. Mary's would give Gonzaga a run for their money in the West Coast Conference, but like now in November, I'm not really in the mood for St. Mary's. But New Mexico State, St. Mary's are actually two, you know, very competitive mid-major schools but wasn't piquing my interest to watch at two in the morning 
I did catch a fair amount of games, though. First one I saw was uh, Miami and Florida. I caught the first half of that. But the first game that I watched straight through isn't even a part of the ESPN Marathon. It was Western Illinois coming up to Chicago to take on the UIC Flames. I'm never sure if, like... And the national audience still needs to hear it being called Illinois Chicago or if UIC is fine. But, you know, the UIC Flames, they played uh, in the West Loop where UIC is located. They played last night in front of a regional audience on the uh, regional sports network here, Comcast Sportsnet, and then also on ESPN3. So it was a worldwide sort of thing for my alma mater, Western Illinois, and the local side, UIC. I actually have connections down at, at UIC, people that have gone there, people that have worked there. So it, that particular matchup was very, uh, it's a pretty personal matchup for me. So I, of course, was glued to the television, even though there was a higher level of basketball being played on a more widely distributed channel. But no. WIU and UIC that was the first real game of the night to me which is funny because the second half of Miami and Florida that I missed out on was when Miami closed the gap and was able to come back and get the win at O'Connell but I hey I, I made my decision and I'm very happy with the game that I watch now just to to say that I saw it I'm probably going to watch the archive of Miami and Florida and that's the awesome thing about on-demand sporting events I know I have been talking about that a lot over the past couple of weeks but I'm, I'm, I'm just spreading the gospel man it, there's nothing like having it an awesome sporting event waiting for you for free or you know as it, free as it is since you're going through your cable provider to pay for it but to just have the sporting event waiting for you after you missed it. It's not like the old days where if you missed a, a football game or you missed a basketball game, you were SOL. Like, no, all this love is waiting for you. So that I'm very excited about that. And I can experience Miami's fierce comeback for myself because they were not looking good there in that first half. So to hear that they eventually turned things around and, and came back is amazing. But... The game that I chose to watch instead, that I promised you I was very happy to watch, was WIU and UIC. It was an entertaining game, at least for somebody like me. I know that to the national audience, it would probably be labeled as a pretty awful game. I mean, you have two teams that shot about 38% from the field. Western Illinois shot 39%. UIC shot 37%. Though for a team like UIC that's been par for the course, they shot 42% last year. So below average on offense. Uh, but in the end, it was still a very hard-fought game. And you you, you can't, you know, the, there's nothing really wrong with that in the end. I will say that uh, UIC front court, man, he's labeled as a forward. He could probably be a center in certain games. Uh Jake Wigan or Jake Wiegand, I'll say. He really showed out. He came up with a double double, 28 and 11, 28 his career high. He was really making uh inroads both inside and outside. He went uh 9 of 17 from the field and he was able to even knock down a three in the process. He was not afraid to step out. He shot the most threes of anybody on his team so he apparently has the range he also was able to make his way to the line he hit nine of ten remember hit your free throws kids so he really had a, a career game in the uic second game of the season i feel like while the rest of the team is out there just struggling on offense somebody like jake wiegan could really come through for uic and help them uh bounce back from what was a horrible year last year where they just went on an enormous losing streak through the middle part towards the end of the season and that it pretty much sunk their hopes of making a postseason in the Horizon League. So uh, Jake Wiegand, if you're a, a mid-major hound sort of person, be sure to keep a lookout for that name. Uh, also probably keep a lookout for names like, uh, like Mark Brown. That was watching the telecast 
and they always spotlight certain players that you should watch. Mark Brown was that guy. Personally, watching UIC over the past couple of years, I don't know why you would make Mark Brown that guy unless it's only because he's a senior. And so you're like, oh, seniors. Those are the guys that have the most experience. So, of course, he's got to be good. No, I, I found him to always struggle with his shooting. And that's like the one thing that he can like really do is shoot the ball. Or that's what he has a tendency to do is to put up shots. But he's pretty much averaged about 30, like below average, like mid 30s low 40s over the course of his career so to expect him to come out here and just turn it on offensively in his senior year uh that's asking a lot of the dallas texas native he went two of ten last night for western illinois a whole bunch of new faces on that team i think they have 10 on their team but their head coach billy wright who was an assistant coach went away to ball state to assist there for a year and then he's come back as the head coach uh, he has a 10-man rotation going, so he's apparently figured that out. Usually when you have that many players, it's like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do with all of these players? But Billy Wright is apparently made up in his mind, or at least this is my first game that I've seen out of Western, but the fact that he had a 10-man rotation going tells me that he knows you know, who he wants to bring out. But they, they couldn't get much going offensively, 38.7% from the field. Their leading scorer, their go-to guy, is Garrett Covington. He was held scoreless in the first half, but he was able to pick up seven points in the end. One thing that I'll give him credit for is that even though he couldn't quite find the bucket, especially in the first half when he was shut out, he was more than capable of you know, staying in the game. He wasn't moping off in the corner. He was still involved in the offense. He was able to consistently pick up assists. He had nine on the day, or nine assists on the night. One thing is he did foul out on a play where he didn't know that he had already had four fouls. So you got to, uh, that's one of those things where you need to work on your awareness with that to make sure that you know how many fouls you have. But he fouled out trying to make a, a play to stop the clock, trying to foul to stop the clock. So you got to also give him credit to have the awareness for that. But, you know, you also got to remember the fouls that you happen to have, especially at UIC Pavilion, where they have a scoreboard at the end of the horseshoe style of the stadium. I think there's fouls on there. So that probably should have been something that Garrett Covington paid attention to. But I was very excited to watch two teams that I care about face off and fight even though it was awful in the box score, I really very much enjoyed it. And you can enjoy it too. It is on ESPN3, available for replay. So if you want to, to experience the joy that I did last night, you can head over to watch ESPN and you can go ahead and check that out. But there were other games in the tip-off marathon. And don't worry, I'll actually talk about them. About I'm about to talk about teams that you actually know exist. After this quick break here, it's the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network.
the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. We are in the midst of a marathon, a college hoops tip-off marathon. ESPN has put it on every year since at least the late 2000s. I'm trying to think. I think 2009 was the first year for the 2009-2010 season because I just remember I was in my dorm room at Northern Illinois for that one semester and I heard about college basketball being on for 24 hours and that's when I thought yeah I need to watch all the games and I tried I think I got to the start of the the 6 Eastern game uh, which was on the East Coast I think it involved like Niagara or St. Peter's or somebody like that but uh, ever since then I've kind of toned it down, and now this year I would have I would have gone to sleep if I wasn't uh, doing some projects. I never, when I'm doing creative stuff, I'm never sleeping, which is not the best thing to do in the world. But uh, otherwise, I knew like I'm cutting back now. I know I can't watch all 24 hours. I don't think anybody at ESPN expects a person to watch all 24 hours. It's really just kind of a Hey, watch when you can. When you wake up, there'll be basketball there for you. If, you, if you're if you somewhere at work or something, you can cut it on during the day. There's basketball for you. I think it's more of one of those things instead of one of these endurance tests or something. Like, how much basketball can you watch? Uh, one of those deals there. Like any other marathon, like a television show marathon, like the perpetual SVU marathons that seem to be on USA all of the time. But... You know, you got to appreciate ESPN for kind of making the first Monday and first Tuesday uh, of college of the college basketball season, the unofficial start of college basketball season. It really does make this whole marathon, just putting it, just clumping all this basketball together. It definitely does bring like a, a aura of excitement to it that that much is for sure. So, you know, I got to I got to give props to ESPN because basketball is my favorite sport, and you're you bringing it all to me, giving me all the all the hoops. Hashtag so much hoops. So what games did I watch? I already talked about Western Illinois and UIC, which technically isn't part of the marathon. It was on uh, CSN Chicago, and it was on ESPN three, but it was not part of the marathon. It was you know the marathon was not acknowledged on the broadcast. Uh, but I had watched the first half of Miami and Florida missed the part missed the cool part the second half but caught the first half but after that I the first full game of the ESPN marathon that I watched was SMU taking on Gonzaga in Spokane so both the Mustangs and the Bulldogs two teams that I brought up in my college basketball preview episode yesterday face off in Spokane at 11 Eastern, 10 Central. And it's packed inside the kennel, the McCarthy Athletic Center, as it always is. Gonzaga's excited. They have a, a lot of new pieces coming in and a lot of very talented players. And they're ready to go against a highly touted SMU team that many feel was wrongly snubbed and, uh, out of the NCAA tournament last year. So SMU is looking for redemption, looking to fight their way into the tournament so that the committee doesn't even have to deliberate about it. It's just a matter of which seed, not if they're in. So SMU has a bit of a redemption story going for them, but they go to Spokane and just like a lot of teams that step into the Mar McCarthy Athletic Center, just it just didn't work out for them. They fall 56 to 72. And really, just watching that game, I wish I could give you like some really deep analysis. Like they ran the pick, the the key here was the pick and roll, and they were moving off of down screens. And but really, what it came that did that was a thing. The the offense for Gonzaga moved very smoothly. So that I guess that hypothetical I just came up with had a nugget of truth in it. But it you don't need a lot of deep analysis to understand that it was just all Gonzaga at the end of the day Gonzaga seemed much more composed they were much more aggressive they had the better three-point shooters 
at the end of the day. Not much of a surprise there. And they, they just came out in front of their home crowd, a team in Gonzaga that is notoriously great at home. So even though people come into the SMU Gonzaga game not knowing who was going to win, and it was definitely up in the air, and it's two very tough teams facing off against each other, which of course makes for great basketball. Once you see how the outcome goes, and once you see the final score, which as I said was 72 to 56, then you realize, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Gonzaga at home against a team that had to come all the way from Texas. Yeah, that, that actually makes a lot more sense than what I had in my head. Gonzaga outshot SMU 45% to 31%. Outshot them from 3, 42% to 38%. Not to mention that Gonzaga chucked up 24 three-pointers, making 10 of them, while uh, SMU mustered up 16 and was able to put down 6. The only advantage that I guess you could say in terms of shooting for SMU was that they were better at the line. SMU shooting 75%, Gonzaga shooting 40%, but Gonzaga was able to convert so many points, so many more points from three that it kind of <laughs> didn't matter at the end of the day. Because I, I recently thought about this, and I know Keener basketball minds are like, yeah, duh. But when you look at a box score and you see the three-point make in an attempt section, and you'll see like only a, you'll see a team like win substantially, and then you'll only see like a, a small gap between how many three pointers were made on each side. When you think about it, it's very it is quite important that small gap in terms of three pointers, because as as I said before. Gonzaga did better behind the three-point line. They shot 42% from outside, while SMU shot 38% from outside. SMU went 6 of 16. Gonzaga went 10 of 24. So that's 10 made threes for Gonzaga to 6 for SMU. 4-3 gap. That's a 4, three point, four made three-pointer gap. That's twelve a 12-point 12 margin in three point in three pointers and that can make a world of difference as we saw here and really it was just a matter of uh, just Kevin Pangos just couldn't be stopped of those 10 made three pointers half of them were by Kevin Pangos and every time he hit them it was in space like even in, even if it was a little bit of space if the SMU player was able to close out on them, sure, late, but was still able to close out on them all the same. Still, it was too late. Like, you got to keep a body on him. You got to deny him the ball because otherwise, if he gets just a little bit or if he hits you with the step back and he puts up the three, it most likely is going down. Kevin Pangles finished uh, 5 of 8 from outside. He was 6 of 11 from the field overall. So he led all scores with 17. And I was impressed, thoroughly impressed. I mean, I know Kevin Pangos has been there. What It feels like it's been like five years, but he is, he's a senior. So it's four, so I wasn't too far off. I was trying to make a joke and then it ended up being truth. Funny how that works out. But this was really my first time actually concentrating and seeing and observing a Gonzaga basketball game in a very, very long time. Uh, because a lot of the times, you know, they're, of course, part of ESPN's West Coast Conference package. A lot of their games come on late on the weekends when I'm trying to do stuff and things socially. So I miss out on a lot of Gonzaga basketball. And if this is what I, I've been missing out on, I sorely apologize to the Gonzaga Bulldog Athletic Department that I was not a believer beforehand. I know I was saying that I was hoping that St. Mary's or BYU or San Francisco could make something of a conference race for the West Coast Conference. And I'm not backing off of that. I mean, parity can be a very fun thing unless your favorite team is involved in that parity. Then I guess it isn't. 
But at the same time, uh, if this is the team, if this team can at least be mostly consistent, uh, I'm I'm all in. I'm all in on Gonzaga taking over the WCC. I would just hope that the teams that they face on a regular basis in their conference schedule could probably, you know, make it at least a little bit tougher. But Gonzaga, honestly, they're they're deep. I mean, you look at their starting lineup. You got Gary Bell Jr. and Kevin Pangos, who were and uh, Premit Karnuski, who are very reliable. And then you have Kyle Wilcher and Byron Wesley, who transferred in. You got Kyle Wilcher coming from Kentucky. You got Byron Wesley coming in from USC. And then you have Demontis, uh, Demontis Sabonis, Arvidas' son. He comes in from the Spanish league, like professional Spanish league. Like the he didn't get paid, but he was still playing pro ball in the second best professional league in the world off the bench. And then you have a steady three-point shooter in Josh Perkins. And then Angel Nunez, he impressed me as well for Gonzaga. If all of them can play at least remotely consistently where, like, it's not a complete power outage on a given night, then Gonzaga could really cause some problems in the tournament because that's really what it comes down to, right? Just wondering, what does this mean for March? Well, this team, after this one game in November, looks like they could be poised to make a run at the second weekend in March. Like, I'm not about to say they're going to the Final Four, but they can make it. I could believe them if they get the right seed, making it to the second weekend. Very talented team, very deep for a mid-major squad, and very, very exciting to watch as well. Northern Iowa and Stephen F. Austin just went final, and I'll talk about that. Uh, after I come around to my break, which actually is coming up very soon. The last thing I want to point out about SMU Gonzaga is that Adam Morrison is there. I didn't know that's where he ended up. He's looking very svelte yesterday. He, he cleans up very well. This is the Raymond Sim Show on the Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. Number one here on the Raymond Sim Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. It's, you can check me out live streaming at Spreaker.com. It'll be available on demand on this very site shortly after the completion of this episode. And I'm, it's also available on demand on the Coliseum Sports Network YouTube page. You can also check me out on Twitter at Sims Coliseum. 
And you can check out my Tumblr, simscoliseum.tumblr.com. And also be sure to like my Facebook page, which is also called Sims Coliseum. You see how streamlined that is? I, I, I like to keep things simple. It, sometimes. Sometimes I can't help. But uh, to go th go the long way, I guess you could say. Kind of just make things difficult. You know, do one thing and it's like somebody observes it and they're like, couldn't you have just did that? And then I'm like, oh yeah, I could have. Manhattan and Massachusetts now on the air on ESPN2. The Stephen F. Austin Northern Iowa game went into overtime and then it went final. And it ended with Northern Iowa picking up the victory at Stephen F. Austin, breaking their 33 game uh, home winning streak, I believe is what they they said that Stephen F. Austin had. I will not. I'm not going to pretend to know because St Stephen F. Austin and the Southland Conference is very foreign to me, and especially considering that they've had so much turnover that they have a bunch of bunch of new schools in there. So yeah, considering how localized the Southland is, I'm not not. Wasn't too familiar with Stephen F. Austin. They made quite the impression during the tournament last year. If you don't know who Stephen F. Austin is, Stephen F. Austin, a school from uh, Nagadoches, Texas. I think that I pronounced that right because there's like in Texas and Louisiana, there are two cities that kind of are derived from the same name. And I think in Texas, it's called Nagadoches. And in Louisiana, it's called Natchitoches. But it's spelled like Natchitoches. So if you ever go down there to Natchitoches, Louisiana, and you don't want to sound like a lo uh, a foreigner or an outsider, I just I just put you on game. At least I think I did, because I think that's the pronunciation there. But Nagadoches, Texas, that's where Stephen F. Austin is. They were the Southland Conference champion. They were pretty much winning all the games. They could not be stopped. They were able to go uh, mostly undefeated. I'm checking here. Uh, well, not most. Well, yeah, mostly undefeated. They just had a really incredible record. They lost their games at Texas, of course and at East Tennessee last year. And then they proceeded to go on a 20... I'm counting here because I'm looking directly at the schedule. I'm trying to refresh my memory. And I didn't expect to go on this tangent. Usually I'm able to prepare ahead of time for my tangents, but not today. It is a 29-game winning streak that they went on all the way into the tournament. They knocked off VCU in the first round, blowing up my bracket, of course. And then they met up against UCLA on day two, or like day three or four, depending on how that worked out out there in that San Diego pod. Uh, they lost to UCLA by 17, but before that, ripped off 29 straight wins. They were pretty much the ultimate Cinderella if there ever was one. So this year, they have a little more attention. As a matter of fact, they picked up top 25 consideration. They got one point. Don't know what voter gave them that point, but they had one point. So somebody considered them in the top 25. I presume they put them 25th. But yeah, they're, they're not a surprise team anymore. So they're getting the best of everybody, including a Northern Iowa team, from the Missouri Valley, the always tough Missouri Valley Conference. They come down to East Texas, and Northern Iowa is able to get the win in overtime. In terms of scores, two 20-point scores for Stephen F. Austin, Thomas Walkup, a starter, and then Demetrius Floyd off the bench, both finishing with 20 points. Uh, Jacob Parker had 15 he was the third leading scorer on the Lumberjacks. And then there were five different UNI Panthers in double digits, led by Marvin Singleton's 15. He also had six rebounds in the process. Seth Tuttle, a name that I've actually heard more often than not, he finished with 13.8 rebounds and three assists. 
So Northern Iowa going down there early in the morning, an 8 o'clock start local time down there in Texas. And Northern Iowa was able to come out with the win on the road. Like they had the deck stacked against them and they were able to pull through. You can only imagine how crazy it's going to be for this team down the line when they have to play in the conference tournament in St. Louis, the infamous Arch Madness, where all the Missouri Valley teams come together and there's always some craziness going on there in terms of, of teams knocking off other teams and just all-out brawls in terms of, of figurative brawls. And I, I don't think there's really been any fights that have happened at the event. But, you know, it's just such a hard-fought uh, tournament. So that's going to be very fun if Northern Iowa can withstand this deck of cards stacked against them, what they can do in a tournament setting. Uh you know, during prime time against some of their rivals. So now it's on to the next game. And it's really interesting whenever I watch the this marathon and they always bring up the clock every so often and they're like, it's hour number five, it's hour number seven. It's very weird to me how quickly the hours can tally up. Like, I could have sworn at one point, you know, like I started off watching the the Miami Iowa game and and they, we were in the first hour. I come back around like around midnight, of course, and like you know Auburn Colorado's on and they're like we're in hour number 5. And it's like how did we well I don't remember if it was hour number 5, but it's like it was a, a hour that I didn't expect and I'm looking, I'm doing the math, looking at the clock. I'm like how did that happen? And it, it's very weird how time can get away from you when you're trying to watch you know basketball games back to back because don't forget these things are two hours it's like a movie marathon when you try to sit down and you watch all your favorite movies and next thing you know the day is over that that can happen with college basketball marathons the time sneaks up on you and i've happened to have learned that over time so you know, but the games must go on. So, you know, let the hours tick. I think we're in hour number 17 right now. Like, during the Stephen F. Austin game, they brought that up as well. And I'm like, what? How? Where did all the time go? Oh, it's. I guess you just got to enjoy the time while you can. Or if you miss any time, you can catch it on demand. There, that's... That's my solution to everything. Auburn and Colorado was pretty much the only other game that I have seen so far in the uh, throughout this marathon. So just to recap, uh, started off first half of Miami and Florida. Watched WIU and UIC. Uh, then there was a 30-minute like time, the opening there. I flipped around to a couple of games. I saw Georgia State and Iowa. And that that was a decent game. I am really excited about Iowa State because I really want to see what those transfers can deliver to to Fred Hoiberg's team. Uh, Hilton Coliseum was full as it as you would expect it to be, but there was an assistant coach. Oh, and also I was I was reminded that R.J. Hunter is still playing for his his father at, at Georgia State. I wasn't sure if he if he was drafted already or was overseas already or whatever, but no, he's still there. One of Ron Hunter's, the head coach at Georgia State, one of his assistants, I was very confused about what his situation was. He was sitting there next to Ron Hunter as an assistant would. He was talking over some stuff or whatever. He looked like a cross between former NBA player and college basketball analyst Adrian Branch and Kyrie Irving like he was young enough to be Adrian Branch's son but he looked old enough to be Kyrie Irving's dad it was very weird to me and then his hair his hair troubled me because I wasn't sure what was going on it looked like from the angle that the camera was presenting to me that his hair was half black or like half gray or whatever like maybe like some gray peppered in maybe he's an older gentleman like half black and possibly gray and like half mostly white and black like somebody like he had chalked half of his hair 
and it was slowly coming off. That's what it looked like. But as I think about it now, and as I talk myself through it, I'm thinking, huh, maybe that was, was that like, was that the lights? Was that the lighting at Hilton Coliseum? I've never been inside of that gym to know if the lighting just is weird like that. But uh, I don't know. Nobody else's hair was weird like that. I don't know who that gentleman was. Uh, But to to finish up my recap here before I, I go too far down that rabbit hole. So it was like Georgia State and Iowa State. I know there was a women's game, women's game on. I believe that was UConn and Stanford at the time. But it was in a commercial every time I tried to flip and watch, flip over and watch. And then Binghamton and Providence was going on on Fox Sports One, but uh, I just I wasn't feeling that. Uh, no, I wasn't into it. And there were not a lot of people there at the Dunkin' Donuts Center either. So. I, nobody was really showing up. Didn't have as much pomp and circumstances, say, being on a, a part of an all-night marathon on ESPN, even if you are on at an actual, if you are in at one of the games that's on at a decent time, you're still a part of ESPN's marathon. Got to show up to that. But Fox Sports 1 at a pro arena in downtown Providence, eh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back around during the conference schedule, even though the attendance there tends to be light. In general as well. Come on, Providence, support your Friars. They're 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 making they're making inroads in the conference. Got to show them some love, man. They didn't renovate that place for nothing. But uh, and then after that, then uh, SMU and Gonzaga, and then after that, Auburn and Colorado, and then that was my night. And then I started working on my project overnight. Auburn and Colorado was actually a pretty good game. I told you yesterday I was intrigued by Colorado because of uh, how well they did at the end of last season without their key players. So now they have to move on and they're more experienced this year and what that could mean. Apparently it meant a lot against Bruce Pearl's new squad, who I'm also excited about just because it's Bruce Pearl leading the way. I want to see him redeem himself. But Colorado apparently in the second half reeled off 52 points and only allowed 25 and they won 90 to 58. So that surprised me more than anything. More tip-off marathon talk on the other side. It's the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network.
Raymond Sim Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. I'm just ripping on it here about the uh, College Hoops tip-off marathon and how great it's been and how much I'm looking forward to it, to the rest of it, uh, over the rest of this day. Gonna need to get some sleep in here somewhere, but uh, I'm probably going to after, shortly after this show, as I usually do, and then I'm probably I'm gonna wake up for Wichita State in Memphis and then sleep after that. And then I'm gonna catch the Champions Classic game. So that's my plan. Uh, be sure to join me here as I talk about general sports talk two hours every weekday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern on the on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. I keep today, I don't know what it is with me today. I keep saying uh you know this is the Raymond Sim show and I keep wanting to say on the Coliseum Sports Network which I don't understand because all for the past several shows I've been saying on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. But today I don't know the Coliseum Sports Network just wants top billing. So uh I don't know. Just got to get better at, at remembering that. Two women's games led off the marathon in tandem with some of the other uh, men's games that were happening on alternate networks. They were Baylor and Kentucky and Stanford and Connecticut. And I can't confirm that that is the correct order. I, I don't know why I wasn't was so unsure when I was there to see on the screen that, you know, that was the time and what was going on and the highlights and all of that. Baylor and Kentucky, followed by Stanford and uh, Connecticut. I'm not about to go into a full analysis, and I'm going to tell you why very shortly. But just to give you the score, uh, number eight Baylor knocked off by number 13 Kentucky, 74-64. And then in Palo Alto, in overtime, Stanford beating Connecticut, the number one team in the nation, 88 to 86. So Stanford, the team that several years ago knocked off or ended Connecticut's 90 game winning streak, I believe it was an even 90 several years ago, they are the streak stoppers yet again, stopping UConn's winning streak at 47 games this time around. They were like, nope, you're not, you're not getting that much farther this time. Uh, we're going to handle you here. So. Brianna Stewart leading the way for UConn in a losing effort, 23-10. and 10, Just impressive. Uh, but the uh, leading score for Stanford, Lily Thompson coming out with 24 points, uh, leading all scores pretty much between Stanford and uh, UConn. Now, the reason that I'm not, that I... I'm not going to give any particularly deep analysis about the doubleheader between Baylor in Kentucky and Stanford is you in UConn is because quite frankly I can't and there's not much that I can say uh, about either of those two games. Women's college basketball is not my forte, and that's not indic indicative of the of the game itself. Uh, of women's basketball I, I find all forms of basketball very enjoyable it's just that I in trying to immerse myself in in the men's game here to begin with it's hard enough trying to get used to following the the right team so to speak you know the teams that are more high profile in the men's game that I'm, I don't want to put too much on my plate here so I'll probably get once I get acclimated with the world of 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 men's college basketball, I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to ease my way into women's college basketball, uh, no problem. But for the most part, I've I've really been in the in the dark. But it seems like there's not much to be missed in terms of storylines and development over the course of a given season, at least in the world. Of women's college basketball and consider that title nine became a thing relatively recently like it's been around for years and let me get let me get the actual years right i don't want to just 
you know, throw it out in the air like it's not a, such a significant piece of legislation because it most certainly is. Uh, it's been around since 1972. So when you think about the development of certain sports over time, for instance, professional basketball, it takes time. Those things take time to develop into the styles, uh, the, the gameplay styles that we know and love today. So women's college basketball is a fully supported sport. It's still in the midst of developing into something that will bring us more parity, much like the men's college basketball game. But right now, the the best teams get the best players, and they are just pushing along. It, but that lack of parity is the sort of thing where during the halftime report that after a while they start replaying with every game, the, the, they replay the same halftime report. That is another reason I didn't watch the, the late games is because the halftime reports get so annoying because they're so redundant because... They aren't having any studio hosts stay at 3 in the morning just to do a halftime report for High Point in Lehigh in uh, Hawaii. But one of the analysts, that I, I think it was either Rebecca Lobo or Kara Lawson, or maybe it was Kevin Nagani describing the action. Somebody said it, and it was surprising to me. But they were like, oh, this major upset, Baylor uh, falling to Kentucky. But it's like, wait a minute. It's the number eight team and the number thirteen team. Like, how's it? It's not an upset. It's just a, it's just a, a really good, important win for Kentucky. I mean, I don't know. I was going somewhere. I was about to relate Gonzaga and SMU, but Gonzaga was the higher seed team in that instance, so I had to stop that right in its tracks before I got too far on that road. But to consider a eight falling to a thirteen and upset, I think says something about the level, the lack of parity in the world of women's college basketball right now at this immediate point in time. Uh, that there's such a, there's the top teams, the top one or two or however many teams, then it drops off to like really, really good teams, and then it just drops off to good teams, and it, it goes down from there. And I know that just from watching like, the teams here in the state of Illinois. I used to run. I used to do an Illinois sports blog, college sports blog, and I covered women's basketball. And to see the teams that were unranked take on just teams that were maybe uh, just a level or two above them in terms of talent, and they go out there and just get blown out. And it's like, whoa, easy now. The the team isn't that much better than you. But I think, it's, again, it's just really the, the lack of parity and just the development of the game of, of, of women's college basketball. It's still coming along, and I think it's made great strides. It's very it's exciting to watch, especially in those final rounds. But the thing is that once you get to those final rounds, you pretty much know who's going to be there. I know I've tried to, I tried to fill out a bracket one year just on a lark. And I just picked, like, random teams, like, random favorites. And more often than not, I, I, I look, was looking pretty good just picking favorites. Because there there's a sizable level between... It's not like the NCAA tournament. You're not going to find a lot of... The 5-12 the matchup is not as dreaded in the, in the women's tournament. At least not just yet. Heck, I don't, a, a 16th seed... No, I think a 16 seed in the women's game has knocked off a one, though. So if you do feel like do, picking that 16-1 upset, it, you might want to fill out a women's bracket because it hasn't happened yet in the men's game. So, you know, just something to think about if you ever feel like picking out a bracket. But all that to say that that is, that that's just, it's just interesting to see games develop over time. I know a lot of people like to take shots. At, at women's sports or at, uh, at women's basketball. But it's just like all of these other major sports. It has to develop. It's taking its time to develop. And right now it's at a stage where the dominant teams are going to roll over everybody. Unless, for Connecticut's case, that team is Stanford. Then I guess they, they'll lose on the road and have their streak broken. In terms of the games that I'm looking forward to, 
Uh, as I said before, there's Wichita State and Memphis. That's going to be on at 1 o'clock local time here in Chicago, so 2 o'clock on the East Coast. Um, I talked about both teams yesterday, actually. Uh, Wichita State coming off of that uh, mostly undefeated season. They they were pretty much undefeated, made their way through the Missouri Valley Tournament, and then they faced Kentucky, and then they lost, like in like in the first round. And everybody thought that Wichita State was, including me, thought that Wichita State was going to knock off Kentucky, but Kentucky shocked the world by being the favorite and beating out Wichita State. So this year, it's a, it's a new year, but the target is. On your back. That's the thing about Cinderella teams is you can be all nice and cutesy and a darling during the tournament, but once the next year comes around, everybody's coming for you. Nobody is surprised. So Wichita State, their first test is against a Memphis team that with if the right pieces come together, could really make a run at the American Athletic Conference title, especially with the departure of Louisville. Kind of opens up the opportunity for Memphis to uh, to knock off UConn, the defending champions, and take over the American Athletic Conference. Maybe get a get a, some consistent uh, uh, seasons, conference championship seasons going. It's really wide open, but I mean you can't doubt the the defending champion, which is really the only reason I think that Memphis isn't getting more consideration, but they can prove it in Sioux Falls, South Dakota today. Uh, it's very funny that which that the stand, I think it's in the Sanford Pentagon. I don't think it's at the, the other new arena that they got. I think it's at the Pentagon, Sanford Pentagon. They got Wichita state and Memphis to both come up and face off. Uh, that that's a pretty good get. But it, it is very unusual to say the least. But Memphis can start their statement now that the American Athletic Conference will need to be on notice. Uh, if Because uh, Memphis is going to definitely try to reassert their dominance. They used to run things there in Conference USA, but it's a new day now and they don't have Louisville on their back anymore. So. It, that that should definitely be a good game, and I'm legitimately excited about it. But between then and the Champions Classic, I, I couldn't possibly tell you who's playing. Uh, I'll talk more about uh, the Champions Classic, and then one other game that will be in prime time that I'm keeping an eye on. And yes, it does involve a local team. Raymond Sim Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network.
Love and the Coliseum Sports Network start right now. Glad that you are joining me wherever you are. Rather, it's 11 a.m. Well, now it's noon, so good afternoon to you out on the East Coast. If it's noon and you're on your lunch break, listening on the Spreaker app. I, I forgot that Spreaker has an app, so good on you for being techno- technologically savvy. Uh, Or if you're out on the West Coast and it is 9 o'clock and you just got into work, you got in, just about to start your 9 to 5 out there, I'm just glad that you're joining me here on Spreaker.com Live, or maybe you might be hearing me on demand. Hello in the future, how are you doing? And you're probably also joining me uh, on the Coliseum Sports Network on demand as well. If you're over at the Coliseum Sports Network, don't forget to like this video and then subscribe to the channel because there will be more of these coming your way in addition to uh, live sporting events too. Uh, speaking of which, I am in Studio B today, the same studio I used to uh, record the pretty much all of the live sporting events I do. I do them off the off monitor. I know. I hope I did not, you know, ruin anybody's uh, sense of whimsy. Or tear down anybody's theater of the mind. But yes, I do call them off of a monitor. I'm not actually at whatever city, whatever locale it is. But uh, this is the studio where I do it. I'm in here because I have the TV on mute. So I can at least have a visual of what's going on with the College Hoops tip-off marathon. But just uh, for some more promo, just to get it out of the way. uh, Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Sims Coliseum. Uh, like the Facebook page of uh, Sims Coliseum on Facebook. And then on Tumblr, if you're on Tumblr, simscoliseum.tumblr.com. Now, during the break, I, w- I was saying in the last segment, well, I, I just went two separate directions. Let me stop. Let me start over. In the last segment, I was saying that after Wichita State and Memphis, I was I didn't remember which games were coming on after that leading up to the Champions Classic doubleheader between Michigan State and Duke and between Kansas and Kentucky. And then, lo and behold, right in front of my face, they showed the schedule for the rest of the afternoon. And one of the games is Utah and San Diego State. And I'm like, oh, of course. I should have known. Utah featuring DeLon Wright who is related to Darrell Wright, the NBA player, and who is pretty much Utah's everything in terms of offense and defense. He's going to be down in San Diego showing off his skills in front of the San Diego Aztecs. And I'm really I'm really uh, conflicted right now because sleep, sleep is important. But it would be sure would be nice to catch DeLon Wright live. But again, it's on ESPN, so I guess I could catch it on demand. But uh, yeah, DeLon Wright, I'm I'm very excited to see what he can do. I hope that he gets more help there in Utah. The only other name, like known commodity, however known Utah basketball can be at this point in time, is Jordan Loveridge down in the post. He's a big man. Uh, He's going to have to provide something of like a two-man game or an inside-out sort of deal. But hopefully him and his team can bring a little more this year to really push Utah to the top because it's yet another down year in the Pac-12, and Utah could really make a case of it, uh, well, at least make a case of being second against Arizona, which when you think about it, I mean, if you take out Arizona, that's first. That's technically first place, right? Yeah, yeah. There's an advertisement here for the Atlantic 10, but they were showing footage like, you know, you know how promos go. There was a lot of cutting and and flashing between different like basketball plays and all of that. And uh, they I thought because the game took place at Barkley Center, I thought it was showing off. A tournament or something like one of the double headers kind of like the champions classic but no it was just at an atlantic 10 commercial i i was having flashbacks to the tournament that the college basketball double header tournament that they do have in brooklyn that uh true tv put on and it just made me wonder randomly huh i wonder if true tv is going to be airing any more games any of 
those tournament games anytime soon. So I'll probably look that up during the break. But all that to say, Utah and San Diego State. Ah, gotta gotta leave a bookmark in my mind to be sure to check that out. Cause San Diego State isn't a slouch either. They are the lone top twenty preseason top twenty five team out of the Mountain West Conference, and they could probably run away with it if they're stacked if they're stacked enough in terms of talent. But in terms of other games that I want to see, of course, there's Michigan State and Duke, and then Kansas and Kentucky. I know everybody is going to be watching that. When these four teams faced off last year in Chicago, all the hype that surrounded that game, it delivered. It it actually came through, and it was there were two very exciting games. So hopefully we can see more of that this year. Uh Michigan State and Duke and Kansas and Kentucky, four teams that I discussed yesterday on the college basketball preview, which you can catch on demand on Spreaker.com and on YouTube at the Coliseum Sports Network. So anything that I allude to today, you can catch in that preview. Uh, Four very exciting teams. They all have their share of new faces and question marks. Uh, Michigan State. Wondering how they're going to replace the production left behind from Keith Appling and Gary Harris and Adrian Payne. Like can Brandon Dawson and the rest of the team step up and still be as dominant and make another run at the tournament. And Duke, of course, has Jaleel Okafor, probably one of the most highly touted recruits in a long time. One of the most skilled recruits in a long time. So there's a lot of excitement around him. Uh, including myself. I'm very excited as well, but there's also some other key gets like Tyus Jones for Duke. Um, so they'll, they'll be they'll be showing off their skills there in the first game. That'll be followed by Kansas and Kentucky, where they uh, where Kansas also has some key uh, recruits in Kelly Oubre and Cliff Alexander from Chicago. Uh, they'll be taking on the ever-reloading Kentucky Wildcats, and they'll have the Harrison Twins and Carl Towns and a whole bunch of other people who are really high on high school recruiting lists. It's just a whole lot of talent. And then the coaches are amazing as well. It really is. It's probably going to have a Final Four type of atmosphere in Indianapolis uh, later on this evening. And I'm excited about that. However, that I am going to have to step away from the Champions Classic, live at least. I'm going to catch whatever I missed on demand. I'm going to make sure of that. Going to have to step away because there are there is another game on another network on Fox Sports 1 that I in particular am very excited about. And yes, it is a local team. I, I watched WIU and UIC yesterday at the expense of higher competition. I'm doing it again today. The Drake Bulldogs... Coming to Rosemont, which is a suburb of Chicago, right next to the O'Hare Airport, which I'm sure many of you have connected flights through. Very nice airport. To take on the DePaul Blue Demons. DePaul just came off of a close, a one-point win to UIC on Friday. So they're going to try to improve to 2-0 on the year against a Drake team. It probably shouldn't be that difficult. I know Drake started off the season against UIC last year, and I think they were able to pull off the win there. This one, since DePaul is a higher level of competition, this one's probably going to be a little more, a a taller task for Drake. But uh, you got to love Drake and the fact that they share the name. They're not named after him, but they share the name of an R&B artist. So that's fun. That could be a lot of Drake jokes that I could come up with on on Twitter when I'm watching and tweeting all night. And also, I like to pronounce their coach's name, Ray Giacoletti. Ray Giacoletti has been a head coach for a very long time. He had stops at North Dakota State, Eastern Washington, and Utah. And then he was an assistant all over the place. He was an assistant for six seasons at Gonzaga. Uh... 
before his first head coaching job in North Dakota State in 97. He was an assistant at places like Oral Roberts and Illinois State in Washington, and then he was also an assistant coach for the Fresno Flames in the defunct uh, World Basketball League, that that basketball league that some of the older people or the the more in tune, very, very, like very in tune basketball historian junkies probably know about the 6-4 and under league. Everybody had to be 6-4 and under. He was an assistant for the team based out of Fresno. Also had an assistant uh, ship at Oral Roberts. But the one thing that jumped out at me is that this Peoria native was a graduate assistant at Western Illinois, which I think is incredibly awesome. And then begs the question, hey, wait a second. Why hasn't Drake played Western Illinois yet? Hmm. Well, this is only Ray Giacoletti's second year at the helm. So there's time. There's time, but it better be soon. Unless something happened, bad happened to him in Macomb and he didn't want to come back. I don't know. But, hey, they need the games for the sake of their con- of their non-conference schedule. They need to beef it up, and I'm sure Drake needs to do the same. But they'll be playing DePaul on Fox Sports 1, so I'm going to be checking that out. Uh, and then I can catch whatever I miss on demand. So I got it all planned out, man. I- I've already endured the most of the tip-off marathon and I'm going to to be strong I've, I've trained I've practiced over the course of these past marathons to make sure that I am ready in the future and I'm I, I got my plan worked out I'm gonna I'm gonna catch all the basketball I want to watch all the all the matchups that look intriguing to me I'm gonna watch them all the games that turned out to be really good I'm gonna check those out too because I have the technology I can watch it all Almost all of it. Which also begs the question, why doesn't Fox Sports 1 have on demand? Why doesn't Fox Sports Go, rather the the mobile thing, why doesn't that have on demand? I need them to go ahead and figure that out so that I can enjoy the fine programming that Fox Sports provides. I can, prov- I can watch it at my own leisure instead of having to pull away from two of the most exciting basketball games of the early part of this season just to watch DePaul. I also have a a, a tiff with Fox because they don't have Fox Sports 2 on my cable system, yet insist on putting DePaul on Fox Sports 2. But that's a whole other discussion for another day. This is the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. Raymond Sims show on Speaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. 
You can join me weekdays, every weekday, from 11 a.m., usually from 11 a.m. Eastern to 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, live at, on Spreaker.com and then on demand on the Spreaker.com website and on demand on my YouTube page, as I've said before uh, numerous times. it's av- uh, The Coliseum Sports Network that I refer to is available at YouTube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sports Net, all one word. Uh, while you're there, be sure to like any videos. There's a lot of them, so you know, feel free to like any of them that you wish. And be sure to subscribe for more sports fiction, for more uh, sports talk. Uh, there, there's just a whole lot of goodness over there at the Coliseum Sports Network for you all to enjoy. As I said before, usually I go from 11 Eastern to 1 Eastern, but I'm actually going to have to cut out here after this segment. Uh, there's still, there's, there is still work to be done. And then there, there's something else I gotta uh, handle uh, right quick, but I, I will have to call it a a midday uh, after the end of this segment. But uh, on the bright side, I'll be back tomorrow at at 11 a.m. And uh, hey, there's more basketball. So if you're if you're at work, and I know I have a lot of followers, and I appreciate you all because I'm constantly just getting more and more followers. I don't know where you guys are coming from, but I'm just glad you're here. If you happen to be listening live and you're at work and you're like, wait, I, I need like talking to, you know, kind of to drone out and be able to do my work. Cause that's how I am with podcasts in general, or when I'm listening to sports radio during the day, I, I, it's a passive medium. So you can know, you can listen, you have something stimulating your mind, like distracting the, uh, any other like distracting thoughts or whatever, and you can c- focus on your stuff. If you're using me for that, I'm flattered, one. And two, I apologize for ending 30 minutes early. But on the bright side, there's basketball. Lots and lots of basketball for you to indulge in. And this is something that we're most likely not going to see, not going to see again on this scale until a- April. Once the, or March rather. Once the NCAA tournament comes around, I, I was saying that and being, I was just being ultra dramatic, I suppose. Like, we're not going to see anything like this again until the end of the year. And then I realized, oh, wait, Thanksgiving tournaments are right around the corner. Like, in a cup next week, like in a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm referring to something that would be related to a calendar. And yet, as I was saying, in a couple of weeks, I'm looking at my wrist. As if to look at a watch where there is no watch. Very odd. Uh, But yeah, we're going to have Thanksgiving tournaments in about a week or two here. And then Christmas tournaments a month after that. So there will be afternoon basketball. But at least during those points in time, you're probably going to be at home. But I know there's there's a lot of workers that (laughs) their, their jobs do not allow for them to take holidays off. So, you know, still... There, there will be afternoon basketball. There's going to be afternoon football very soon, too. Bowl games are coming. I am intending, because almost all of the bowl games are on the ESPN family of networks, which means by extension it's available on demand on Watch ESPN. I am still planning to cover all of the bowl games, including the ones that aren't on, the one or two that aren't on ESPN. I can catch those live. Um, I'm not going to do a preview. Previews are they are intense, very very intense. So I'm gonna go easy on the on the previews. I'm probably gonna go easy on them until uh, until baseball season comes around. Then I'll preview it up again. But I'm gonna watch every bowl game there. So all that to say, man, there's the stuff happening in the afternoon. Uh, it's gonna be very exciting afternoons won't be boring until at least after new year's then then we'll be back to the same old uh you know mundane afternoon activities it's kind of sad when you think about it so i don't want to depress you well let's talk some baseball huge trades went down or huge deals in general went down yesterday during this very time slot during my college basketball preview and I was on, I was scrolled on my timeline during the breaks and I would just see this huge signing and this huge trade and this other huge signing. And I'm like, come on today. 
of all days. Seriously, come on. But baseball waits for no one. The hot stove waits for no one. So there were three massive deals that happened yesterday, and it really does make you wonder uh, when's the next big day coming because there's still plenty of guys out on the market. First one was the rumors of Giancarlo Stanton signing a 13-year deal with the Miami Marlins, or at least the Marlins put a 13-year deal on the table for Giancarlo Stanton. It was 13 years, $325 million. So, of course, the artist formerly known as Mike said, yes, sign me up, I'm all for it. Now, he's it's not like he's chained to the Marlins, because who would want to be? But because he has a he has a opt out clause after a handful of years and he also has a no trade clause that he can utilize and or if or if the team wants to trade him, he can use the no trade clause or waive it or whatever. So it's he's not completely locked in. It's more like a five year contract with the Marlins for sure, and then there's another eight years on the back end. But man, that is just an absurdly enormous contract. And it's really just awe-inspiring. Like, I know that baseball doesn't have a salary cap, but yeesh. That is that is a lot of money to just throw around there. And it also makes you wonder, hey, wait a second. Why haven't you put all this money into the rest of the team? I, I know that Jeffrey Loria did the first year. So that he could get the stadium, and then he blew it up mid. He started blowing it up mid season, and the team has been scrapping and un, and underachieving ever since. I mean, there's good pieces in place in Miami. There's Giancarlo Stanton now for the the next nearly decade and a half, and then there's Jose Fernandez on the mound, who is he's my favorite pitcher ever, and I'm still waiting for the 2013 Atlanta Braves to apologize to him, but. Jose Fernandez is definitely a a, a great pro, a great player. So there's pieces there in Miami, but uh, really, with Jeffrey Loria, um, at least he's spending money instead of going in the opposite direction where he's just selling everybody off. But you do wonder what this means in terms of roster composition for Miami moving forward. Is, is Jeffrey Loria going to be willing to open up the open up the wallet for the re- to make up the rest of the team so that Miami can actually contend? Or is this just signing a star so that people will show up and Mike not either either not thinking about that or not minding that? And he's just happy to live in Miami, get a lot of money, and play baseball because it's very fun. So we'll see how that works out. If Jeffrey Loria must have been visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, and now he's willing to spend money. Or if this was just a big signing to keep uh, the Marlins from being a total embarrassment. Another huge deal that went down, at least in, in my eyes, was the Russell Martin deal. Uh, Russell Martin signing with the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, There was talks about him coming to the Cubs. There weren't any about him coming to the White Sox, which bothered me more than anything. The White Sox need catching very badly, but apparently they're they're either keeping their eye on another catcher or they just really think that Adrian Nieto and Tyler Flowers are going to be the next big thing. uh, But Russell Martin decides to stick with his home country and his hometown team because let's see he was born in Montreal but he went to school in Toronto so he's back in Toronto to play for the Blue Jays and I'm happy for him I'm glad that he chose to do that especially because I I, I didn't want the Cubs to get better but part of me also wanted Russell Martin to you know be in Chicago even if it wasn't with my team but I guess uh, the Cubs, they at least miss out that time with Russell Martin. Russell Martin, to my understanding, is the best catching, uh, was the best catching free agent. So it's actually interesting how quick he was snatched off the table there by Toronto, but a huge get uh, for the Blue Jays. So uh, good on them. 
and good on them for snatching him away from the Cubs. Oddly enough, the Cubs and Blue Jays faced off in my baseball tournament I did on the Coliseum Sports Network during the summer. The Cubs handled the Blue Jays, which was a very funny thing because the Cubs ended up fizzling out eventually. Uh, the other signing, or it wasn't a signing, the other big uh, deal from yesterday was a trade. Uh, there were four players involved, but the two big names were Shelby Miller and Jason Hayward. The St. Louis Cardinals and the Atlanta Braves doing a deal. One team, the Braves, get a starting pitcher. A starting pitcher that was... I, I was hearing good things about him for the most part like during the end of the 2013 season and maybe it was because I wasn't paying attention to the Cardinals that I hadn't heard anything much of him from 2014 anybody you can hit me up at Sims Coliseum on Twitter you can let me know like if I was missing anything if Shelby Miller just had a serviceable year if he struggled if he had an injury because for all I know he was out the whole season but all the same uh, Jason Hayward goes to St. Louis Shelby Miller goes to Atlanta. Uh, St. Louis kind of was uh, pushed to do it by uh, by unfortunate circumstances. Uh, the the un unfortunate passing of Oscar Tavares uh, he, in a car accident in his native land of, of the Dominican Republic. He was an up-and-coming right fielder. Definitely a lot of hype and, and excitement around him and his life just just cut short. Just a very sad story. I meant to uh, at least uh, bring it up and discuss it when it actually happened, but I, I don't know. With the start, with me trying to start the show, just get this off the ground. I guess I, I overlooked that, and I apologize for that. I'm definitely remiss for uh, for doing that. But so so while the Cardinals and the Cardinals Nation are all grieving about the loss of such a, a, a good guy and such a wonderful player on the business side, they had to do what they had to do. And they pick up the all-star star, Jason Hayward, who had a productive season. I think his numbers were down a little bit from his usual production, but he's still, he's still pretty good. And I think that maybe a new setting could do some good for Jason Hayward, especially in an environment like cart, like a Cardinals nation. I think the fan base will embrace him. I think the team, We'll probably embrace him as long as he doesn't have an attitude or anything. I don't know. But it's, I think the, the trade works out for both sides, not to mention the prospects that also went in the opposite directions as well. Both of those sides could definitely turn into something. So even though I'm in the midst of a college basketball marathon, I can still talk about baseball. And of course, we'll talk about baseball throughout the winter because the hot stove is just it's just somebody just cut it on it's still preheating it, it's getting ready to go so there's still much more to talk about john lester is still out there he's one of the big names still waiting to be signed i think the cubs and the braves they're talk they're talking with him that was the report but uh yeah there's still there's still much baseball news to be had i haven't forgot about baseball i'm i'm waiting for pitchers and catchers to report still but uh, today I know it's mostly college basketball. I'm net tomorrow. I'm probably going to be talking just like the games that I saw this evening. Going to talk about that. Going to, I think I'll jump into football because of course the the college football rankings come out. I think I might jump into football rather than it's recapping last week or uh, probably recapping last week, if anything, or talking about the NFL week, because I know I've neglected football for the past couple of days. I'm sorry. I got y'all possibly tomorrow, but definitely Thursday and Friday for sure. And then uh, if anything else crazy happens in baseball, I'll bring that up as, as well. Basketball, football, baseball, all the sports right here on the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network. I thank you guys for listening today. Sorry I had to cut it short by 30 minutes. Hope you don't mind. But just be sure to join me tomorrow at 11 Eastern, wherever you may be. Have a wonderful day, everybody. This has been the Raymond Sims Show on Spreaker.com and the Coliseum Sports Network.